So yeah, everyone else will just be speaking. And we've got a great lineup of speakers who are actually directly working with NTFPs. And we're very pleased to have these speakers because uh, they really know what we're talking about. First, we're Dr. Rajat Mukhtari, who's the chairman of I the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but also the director general of the Energy and Resources Institute, which is one of India's premier environmental institutions. And you really know the scene in India, as well as the uh, effects of climate change on forests and agriculture. Then there's Dr. Fatuni, who will who is uh, a DG in the Ministry of Forestry in Indonesia. Also, he is on the, one of the council members of the International Network of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. He will give us the picture of what's happening in Indonesia, what needs to what needs to be done, what is being done, how they're addressing these issues. And finally, there's Dr. Hans Frederick, who's the Director General of the International Network of Bamboo and Rata. Now, uh, this with uh, Dr. Frederick, it's kind of interesting because he's managing the INVAR. His background is with a conservation organization, which is also part of this whole discussion. How do we conserve? How do we use? How do we make sure that we're keeping enough stocks in the future? So, uh, with that, I've uh, uh, asked the speaker only to speak for about 10-15 uh, minutes. After that, we we'll take some questions and have a general discussion. I will then try and sum up if there is some, something that needs to be summed up. Otherwise, uh, if you want to there, if you have any questions, somebody can ask. So, Thank you very much, and I'm very happy that we're discussing this subject which uh, is often ignored and doesn't get the kind of attention it deserves. But clearly, if you look at the lives of a large number of people, uh, they are intimately connected with what happens to this whole sector. As a matter of fact, if one goes back maybe 200 years or so, you would find that there's been a progressive and highly measurable decline in our stock of bamboo and rata. And that's essentially because there have been substitutes developed for a large number of products and uses that were dependent on the growth of bamboo and rata. And as a result, communities and societies have neglected uh, what was earlier on an absolutely crucial part of their lives. Uh, what's going to be a major influence in the future is going to be climate change, which is essentially human-induced. And as you're aware, the IPCC ha has brought out <coughs> three parts of its fifth assessment report. We have yet to bring out the synthesis report, which is essentially, as the name suggests, a synthesis of all the three working group reports that have come out so far. And that will be completed at the end of October this year. But I'd like to acquaint you with uh, some of the major findings of the reports that have come out. And these have major implications for all species on planet Earth therefore also on bamboo and rattan. Firstly, let me say that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. This is something that is beyond uh, the bounds of any reasonable intellectual or scientific debate. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. So in other words, in a short period of time, we have affected the climate of this planet at a rate that we have not seen for millennia. The atmosphere and oceans have warmed, uh, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, sea level has risen, and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased. Just to give you one indicator, carbon dioxide at the beginning of industrialization was about 280 parts per million in the atmosphere. In May of last year, this figure crossed 400 parts per million. So there's been 
roughly a 40% increase in uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and you have almost similar increases that have taken place with other greenhouse gases and most of these are the result of human activities. I also want to highlight the fact that each of the last three decades has been successively warmer at the Earth's surface than any preceding decade since 1850. So as a matter of fact, uh, the last three decades have been the warmest that we have seen very likely for over 1400 years in terms of the increase that's taking place. So that's quite substantial. 19 centimeters is a very large increase to have taken place since the beginning of the last century. And it's been much faster over the last two decades. I also want to mention that uh, since the early 1970s, glacier mass loss and ocean thermal expansion from warming together explain about 95% of the observed global mean sea level rise. Um, and if you want to look at how the concentration of greenhouse gases has increased in a geological time frame, then really speaking, the atmosphere concentration of carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide have increased to levels unprecedented in at least 800,000 years. So, the previous time when we had these kinds of concentrations, which was for very different reasons, was about 800,000 years ago. And it's also true that about 30% of the concentration of greenhouse gases has really gone into, or carbon dioxide in particular, gone into the ocean. Now that's led to acidification. And this has very serious implications for marine life of all forms. Uh, here again, this may not seem to impact directly on, on bamboos and, and rattan. But the basic fact is that, you know, we are all part of an integrated earth system. And therefore, if one part of the earth is affected, that means the oceans, then that also has implications for land surfaces. Now, I also want to mention that Arctic sea ice has been decreasing at a very rapid rate. As a matter of fact, the Arctic has been warming at twice the rate of the rest of the globe. And it's very likely that Arctic sea ice will continue to shrink and thin, and that the Northern Hemisphere spring snow cover will decrease during the 21st century as global mean surface temperature rises. Um, in fact, some models clearly show that we would have an ice-free Arctic Ocean in September before mid-century. Uh, this is particularly so for a scenario. We have got four different scenarios in the IPCC fifth assessment report, and this is particularly true for the scenario which is essentially a do-nothing scenario. In other words, we continue to increase our emissions of greenhouse gases and really take no action to mitigate them effectively. So you can imagine what this really implies because if Arctic sea ice is going to vanish in the month of September before the middle of this century, then that has major implications for temperatures and climatic variables in other parts of the world as well. Um, let me go to some other aspects. Uh, <clears throat> the impacts of climate change, of course, have taken uh, several manifestations. One of them is the fact that crop yields have been uh, more common uh, in terms of negative uh, values than positive. Because with higher CO2 emissions, there is also a fertilization effect 
that takes place with plants because the higher the CO2, generally you would expect much greater growth as a result. But overall, the impact of temperature increase has generally been overwhelmed, overwhelming with respect to this fertilization effect. So the point I'm trying to make is that food security is likely to be compromised. And if that happens, you can imagine, as you heard from Dr. Kulkarni, uh, a large number of people are dependent for their food, fiber, fodder, uh, on, the, on the forests. And therefore, as a result, you would find that there would be, in some sense, a um, multiplier effect in terms of food security being compromised, both on accounts account of agriculture being affected negatively and of course forests also suffering as a consequence of changes in temperature and other uh, climate variables. <clears throat> um, now climate related hazards also are going to be important because these will directly affect the livelihoods particularly of the poor and there would of course, also be reductions in crop yields or destruction of homes uh, and indirectly through, for example, increased food prices and food insecurity. Here I want to highlight that two types of extreme events are going to increase in the future. Uh, these are heat waves as well as extreme precipitation events. In fact, the increase in frequency and intensity of these has already been there for the past few decades, but this is going to become far more accentuated in the future. Now, when you have, let's say, extreme precipitation events, then that clearly has major implications for ecosystems and their stability. And I'll give you an example. In the case of India, we've got a large area of land which is under uh, the Himalayan system and um, what has happened typically is human intervention which has carried out major deforestation at least in the upper and medium slopes of the Himalayan range and at the same time with an increase in extreme precipitation events there has been much greater denudation, much greater erosion of soil cover. Now, as a result of that, you not only have siltation of our river systems downstream, but you also have reduction in the ability of mountain streams and the collection of water in along the slopes of the Himalayan range. And that has major implications for forests and ecosystems in general. Now, I just want to end by saying, I just want to end by saying that fortunately, <clears throat> uh, there is also an enormous opportunity here because forests and bamboos and rattan in particular are great sources of storage of carbon dioxide. And I think under Red Plus, if there is a clear uh, identification of these opportunities and therefore an implementation of projects related to Red Plus, then clearly there would be much greater attraction in the conservation, in the growth and the use of some of these stocks. Uh, I might mention, and this is the final point I want to make, that in the Working Group 3 report of the IPCC which has come out, we have placed much greater emphasis on mitigation in the AFOLU sector. AFOLU stands for agriculture, forestry and land use. <clears throat> and what we have highlighted is the fact that in agriculture there is clearly a great deal of scope for mitigating emissions of greenhouse gases. Reducing deforestation is absolutely crucial and the expansion of forestry area or afforestation is also extremely important. Now, if we were to seize some of these mitigation opportunities, then 
clearly there would be an expansion of the stock of some of the, the species that we're talking about and overall there would also therefore be enhancement of human welfare, particularly of societies who are directly dependent on some of these resources. So I think uh, in the future we would have to ensure that there is a combination of adaptation measures as well as mitigation. To deal with the problem of climate change would be based on a clear understanding and a projection of some of the impacts of climate change and therefore <clears throat> translating that into adaptation measures because there is a certain inertia in the system as a result of which climate change will continue even if we bring about radical reduction in emissions today. And that in itself will not be enough. We will also have to start immediately with adequate mitigation measures. And I think the advantage with bamboo and rattan and essentially forestry species is that you can carry out adaptation as well as mitigation simultaneously by focusing on these species which are really an enormous resource for human society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pachuri. Uh, we'll just move on rapidly, moving from the global picture to more national level picture, with Dr. Tony will tell us about what's happening in Indonesia. Thank you, Manas. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to uh, this opportunity to present. Uh, Indonesian strategy on the development of non-timber forest products. Uh, I think this is very important for us from the global to the national what we have done so far uh, because uh, we have so many uh, potential of the non-timber forest products and then we have to uh, carefully uh, manage and develop the strategy. Since uh, the era of 2000s, Indonesia has shifted the forest management paradigm from timber-based management into resource-based management. The reason is we realized that of the total of the uh, value of the forest, timber is really only 10% compared to 90% of the total value of non-timber forest products. So the consequence is that in the forest management, we have to pay more attention not only timber, but also non-timber forest products. That is, uh, all substances, materials, and all commodities obtained from forest, which does not have to cut down the tree. And then the government of Indonesia, uh, that is the Minister of Forestry, has issued three ministerial decree regarding non-timber forest products. These are number 35, 2007, regarding all items uh, listed uh, dealing with the non-timber forest products from forest. Yeah? And the number 19, 2009, regarding national strategy for the development of non-timber national forest products. And then also for the, 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 for the development priority. And then also uh, we have number uh, 31, 2009 regarding the criteria indicator uh, of the non-timber forest product development priority. Uh, in addition, also the Minister of Forestry issued very important decree, uh, number 39, regarding empowering communities through forest management partnership including on the management of non-timber forest products. This decree instructed all forest permit holders to give access and partnership to forest village communities on their forest area management. Ladies and gentlemen, the non-timber forest products are very important in our daily life. For example, for food, fiber, energy, medicine, fuel, for city conservation, as well as for climate change mitigation and adaptation. We have identified more than 500 
65 items of non-timbovers products consists of 490 flora and 75 fauna for an Indonesian forest which are classified into nine types namely resin, volatile oils, fat, carbohydrates and fruits, tannin and sharp, medicinal and decorated plants, rattan and bamboo of course, animal products, forest services and others. If you want to develop all 565 non tipo forest products simultaneously in Indonesia, it is almost impossible. Therefore, since, 19, since 2009, Indonesia has developed non timbo forest products management strategy, making development priority for the national level, provincial level, as well as district level, and also making cluster of non timbo forest, uh, forest products development to become models and centers for non timbo forest product development in the future. Clustering development take about five years, in the gradient from upstream to downstream industry. Divided into four steps, infrastructure preparation, mass production, creative product industry development, and marketing. At present, Indonesia has selected six non forest product items and their cluster location for the national priority development. For example, Ratan at Katinan, Central Kalimantan, Bambu at Bangli. My colleague, Jaya Mulana, is the president director for the uh, Clean Power Indonesia, now developing the uh, electricity from bamboo. Uh, already hundreds for 250 uh, uh, one units, uh, uh, kilowatt amperes. Uh, this I think is very very challenging in the future. Yeah. This is uh, very important, and also Agarut at Bangka Belitung, Silk at Cianjur. West Java, Ane at Sumbawa, NTB, uh, West uh, uh, Nusa Tenggara, and also Bio Energy from Kalofilom at Yamplum at, uh, at Central Java. In order to gain knowledge and technology for supporting and their peace development, uh, Forest Research Development Agency, FORDA, Ministry of Forestry, when I was the DG for the uh, for that, I developed uh, through special program, what we call as a uh, FAM, uh, uh, for, uh, what is uh, RIP, Research Integrated uh, Program for Foods, Energy and Medicine, and for Non-Foods, Energy and Medicine. So, there are two uh, big uh, program uh, related to, related to non timber forest products. Uh, in the uh, research agency. Since 2010, uh, we have developed a special integrated research program on non timber forest projects for food, energy, medicine, and others. In addition, more support also uh, needed from across sectoral agencies, for example, central, provincial, and district government level. So, because uh, without uh, support, I think uh, the strategy is not uh, goes very well. We realize that it is not easy to implement this non timber forest product strategy. There are still some problems encountered for the development, such as issue on the accurate data and information on the potential and utilization, issue on across sectoral integration and policy an issue on upstream and downstream industry development, issue on availability, availability of resource cultivation and processing technology, and still many others to be resolved, I think, in the near future. So our goal for non timber forest product development in Indonesia are improving local people income, enhancing their awareness and protecting forests, Creating more job opportunities, increasing number and variety of non timber forest products and values such as for food, fiber, medicine, energy, better biodiversity conservation and carbon pool stabilization, as well as we do we do hope that the graded system and regulation for NDIP's development are in place. Finally, 
optimizing non-tier blue forest product development hopefully will lead to better sustainable forest management for better people prosperity. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I've got a lot of photos to just uh, basically help with my presentation, as you were. Um, so I'll be waving to the lady. What, what I want to talk to you about is basically NTFPs and ecosystem services. And if we go back to 2002, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, they sort of define what ecosystem services are, provisions, uh, regulating, and one of the most important ones is presumably food security. Nature provides food. And food is not just, as we've already heard during the opening plenary and again just now in our discussion, not just a question of irrigated agriculture and large grain food crops. Food is also found in other places. For example, some research we did in Atapur, in Lower Laos, showed that all the protein that local people get there basically comes from nature. It comes from the wetlands, comes from the forests, it's not bought, it's not grown, it's effectively non timber forest products. In India, NTFP is a major commodity, major business, large markets, lots of money involved. But NTFP is not just a poor man's food. If you look at Japan or Europe, mushrooms are a delicacy, a highly prized delicacy, a very expensive delicacy. So NTFPs are important for food. And basically, therefore, if you think about a forest ecosystem service, again, the whole trend over the, the last hours has been we need to look at the landscape, we need to look at the bigger picture. A forest is not just a stand of timber. It's an ecosystem with a whole range of services that are important and NTFPs should be considered when you talk about sustainable management of forest resources. I'm the Director General of INBA, the International Network for Bamboo and Rata. So I want to talk a little bit about bamboo. One of the most important maybe NTFPs and an NTFP that has lots of interesting aspects. Going back to where we started, bamboo is a food source. Bamboo shoots are basically a stable food crop in China. Bamboo shoots appear every year. Um, Moso, which is the prominent species of bamboo in China, has new shoots appearing every spring, and they basically can be harvested. Now, there are about 2,000, 3,000 bamboo poles per hectare, and the shoots effectively are the same sort of number. You can harvest half of them, because basically due to space, nutrition and competition, half of them will die otherwise. So it's a good business. Um, most, as I said, density of 1,500 to 4,000 per hectare. As you see, other bamboos have a much higher density. This is a complication. There are 12,000 different species, and the ones that are very dense are basically what we call clump bamboos. These are bamboos that grow in clumps rather than the most of that close in individual species, in individual poles, I should say. But therefore, it is a, a food source. Once the shoots that have not been harvested have grown, and this for bamboo is a question of months. I mean, a bamboo pole basically is as high as it will ever grow in several months. It then hardens over a couple of years, and after four years you can start cutting. And then you can cut it again, and again, and again, every year. So it's an amazingly sustainable crop. And bamboo is used. Everything is used. There's no way since basically the tops are used for fodder, as you can see. Uh, smaller bits are used for, for small items. Waste, which is used for charcoal, I can back to that. And the main thing is the pole, the big pole, that's used for construction. And when I say construction, it's no longer just talking about traditional round pole bamboo housing or furniture. We now make what's called engineered bamboo. These are structural beams, they are wood panels that basically stand the test of time just like any wood product. So bamboo is becoming a very important traded commodity. The current figures are, in 2012, that the export trade for Bamboo and Vatan products was 1.8 billion US dollars. And that's a major underestimate, because this is based on figures in the UN Comptrade database, 
not all countries actually list their bamboo products, and the main issue is that in many countries bamboo still is sold as wood. So these are figures that we get from the statistics, but we know it's an underestimate. We're presumably talking about 2.5 billion international trade, and only in China there's an internal market of something like one, one and a half billion on top of that. So presumably we're talking about four to five billion or so. We're not exactly sure. You see the dip, that was basically the, uh, the economic crisis, but it's coming back up. And we think that with the interest in particularly Europe and USA for ecological products, bamboo trade will go up drastically. Two other things about bamboo. One, as I mentioned earlier, you can make charcoal out of bamboo. You can use it for energy. Not just charcoal, you can also use biogas, you can basically uh, put it in a digester. But it is a source of energy, particularly for poor communities, which has not really been explored to the fullest, and it's a major opportunity. People can grow bamboo on their homestead, around the school, in the local garden, and make it into charcoal. And the other thing, we've already talked a bit about climate change. Um, sorry, I should go back. The actual value of charcoal is not much better than wood charcoal. This has been one of the big debates. The issue is that the raw product is so much more ecologically friendly because bamboo, in its natural condition, doesn't need fertilizer, it doesn't need irrigation, and it doesn't compete normally with agricultural food crops. The other thing is climate change. We talked a bit about it. This is a graph to give you an idea about the mitigation aspect of bamboo. Bamboo absorbs carbon just like any other plant, but because you cut it so fast and so regularly, over a period of time, the absorption capacity is higher than most trees. The other thing is, of course, adaptation. I mean, bamboo, again, because of the fast growth and the fact it's easily harvested and easily maintained, is a major opportunity for adaptation to the effects of climate change. So a very important aspect, and as Dr. Pachari said, not really explored to the fullest by the Convention, and we hope that that will change. Do we know everything about bamboo? No, definitely not. There's still a lot of research to be done. And this is done really by universities, by research institutions, by the scientists. There's also a lot of research being done about how you can actually make money out of bamboo. New designs. These things are sold to the French uh, luxury market at enormous prices. And it's basically weaving from bamboo. And then of course there's all the different uses of bamboo. This incident is a bridge in Indonesia. I thought I should have a picture of your own country. So there's still a lot to be known, a lot to be explored. And one of the issues is that basically, as I think Manoj said earlier, bamboo is a crop, but the Ministry of Agriculture don't really see its relevance because it's not a food crop. Bamboo looks like a tree, but it's not timber, so the Ministries of Forestry also feel that it's not really their responsibility. It falls a little bit between two stools, and this applies not just to bamboo, but to most MDFPs. So, on the basis of that, that you've got all these different people actually having an interest in bamboo, sustainable management of NDFPs requires a lot of collaboration. So just to conclude, or to recap, forests are not just stands of timber, they have many ecosystem functions. NDFPs should be included in sustainable forest management. Bamboo has lots of benefits and values, but not everybody knows about them. NDFPs are neither agricultural crops nor timber stands, and therefore management of NDFPs requires collaboration and partnerships. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm also pleased that everyone kept within their time. Uh, what I'd suggest now is that we can take some questions from the audience, but uh, and then maybe have a little time for the speakers to address each other's points. Uh, first, uh, I'll just start the model by a couple of questions, which may seem pro provocative, but you know, it's, it's something of interest. And Dr. Pachuri, one thing I'm interested in uh, working with the IPCC as well as Terry, I mean, you're famous for bringing together or holding together a bunch of scientists who may disagree with everything else that you do. And with this sort of the primacy of the role of science, do you see any role or anything for, let's say, ordinary people? In and TFPs, do they have anything to contribute to the discussion or has the discussion become a high level discussion where uh, all the research is being done in academic institutions and there's no real room for what ordinary people, the people I was talking about who harvest 
bamboo shoots or medicinal plants? Do they also have some, something to contribute? Well, I think as far as uh, climate change is concerned, it affects the lives of every human being and all living species on this planet. And therefore, even though there's a very high level of scientific knowledge that's required to understand, assess, and project climate change, particularly when it comes to looking a hundred years into the future, in actual fact, it has to be brought down to the level of the average person on the street. Because unless people understand what the realities of climate change are, you're not going to get the kind of response that is required to deal with the problem. And this is a major challenge. You know, the scientific community has not really focused in the past on communicating the results of what they're doing. And this is something that we're trying to do now in the IPCC. But the IPCC has, has a very lean structure in its organization. You'd be surprised, our permanent secretariat is no more than a dozen people. And we really mobilize scientific talent from all over the world uh, for an assessment. And these are thousands of people. In fact, those directly involved in the fifth assessment report uh, number a little over 800 authors and review editors. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the IPCC by itself is not equipped, does not have the capacity to communicate all the science that is carried out by thousands of scientists. 800 are direct authors and review editors, but there are many others who are so-called contributing authors many, many more who are expert reviewers. So the numbers altogether are very, very large. What we need are partner organizations. We need organizations like INBA, uh, which can sort of go out and inform their own constituencies of the impacts of climate change. So what I'm suggesting is, if you were to pick up the findings of the IPCC reports, and then convert them into communication material for different sections of society, I think that would serve an extremely vital purpose. And we need to do that now and get partners across the globe to be able to do that. Uh, Dr. Fitonia, one thing I wanted to ask you, you made a list of some of the NTFPs and spoke about how you needed to have priorities. How do you prioritize NTFPs knowing that people's livelihoods may be at stake, small businesses may suffer if you don't give them priority? So how can you take that sort of decision for, let's say, all the way from Papua to Aceh, you know, of what, what is going to be important, what is worth looking at? Because I mean, once you get government support, there's also money and financial things. Yeah, uh, from the Minister Dukuri, have the instrument how to prioritize uh, for NTFP to be developed nationally, uh, provincial level, district level. So we have uh, four or five uh, indicators uh, 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 that uh, need to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, how about the value of the economics value and also about the environment about the social and also about the, the, the existing uh, capacity we are building in this area. And many others that uh, we need uh, uh, with uh, uh, this kind of the uh, indicators, then uh, we criteria indicators. And then we finally uh, come to uh, one select number uh, and then by this uh, instrument that we uh, selected uh, this kind of uh, uh, and the FPs uh, to be developed nationally, whether or uh, provincially. Uh, this is just on the uh, to make prioritization uh, which one uh, uh, earlier than others. Because so many uh, and the FPs, uh, more than 565 uh, items and then we have to to pick some of them to become the national uh, 
program. We have six uh, uh, national uh, non-tech products. Then uh, we need to be uh, more uh, people, more integrated, uh, stick multi stakeholders to be uh, developed together. Uh, Ratan and Bamboo, one of the uh, six of the uh, national programs. And uh, Hans, if I can just start the first question. One problem with bamboo and some of the things that you were showing is that they are seen as being what the opposite of aspirationalism. You want to use bamboo, let's say furniture or something, until you can afford copper wood. You eat snails until you can have chicken wrapped in plastic or brought from the supermarket right? until you move up. So these are always seen as things that are for lower classes, for undeveloped people. How do you convince people that you know, if bamboo is something that's important? How do you convince them this is worthwhile doing? Don't buy teak furniture, but bamboo furniture is solid. Is that a problem? Um, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but you're quite right that you know some people still call bamboo poor man's timber. I would call it smart man's timber. I think basically the issue is that what we can do with bamboo now is to make products that look as good as anything made from traditional materials. Um, if you look at some of the flooring that is being made in central China and sold to Europe, it's flooring that any of you would want in your house. Um, the challenge there is that bamboo is not yet cheap. I know what you're saying is the products look cheap, but in the past that was maybe the case. You know, I mean, I remember when I was a student, yes, bamboo was sort of the only thing you could afford, basically. The issue is that some of this engineered bamboo, the, 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 you know, the, the modern designed bamboo, is no longer cheap. And I think therefore the issue is how do you convince people to basically not buy teak but buy bamboo is a question of awareness rating. It's a question of explaining to people why using bamboo actually is much better than using forests. And it's a, you know, it's a double whammy if I can put it as simple as that, because on the one hand, you're using a crop which does not affect the environment, and using bamboo is good for the crop. But the other thing is that using more bamboo means you use less wood, so it helps directly to combat deforestation. And I think that is an argument that a lot of people will actually understand but it's something that we haven't really got across yet. So I think we have to explain that better. You know, if you go back in time, it was Mahatma Gandhi who popularized handloom cloth in India. And then, of course, the best designers, the best marketing people got into the act. Today, you can buy the best textiles and, and you know, uh, all the synthetic stuff and produce clothes from them. But often, well-designed handloom clothing costs much more and people attach a much larger value to it. So I think what you really need over here, please correct me if I'm wrong, is the best talent going into the design of products, and marketing it, and essentially seeing that in people's perceptions, there's a premium attached to the use of it. So I think this is really a task for designers, advertisers, marketing people, so that our perceptions change about bamboo, and that will make an enormous difference to the whole cycle of production, conversion, and marketing. Uh, so we, yeah. 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 Questions from the audience? Is there another man? Okay, well, I'll just start off from this side. Uh, Please introduce yourself, say who the question is for, and we'll take a few questions before uh, we start answering. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Danny from uh, C4, Danny and Diawan. Uh, I've been uh, working at, uh, with the for the last uh, several years. Uh, my first question to Dr. Uh, Hans uh, Frederick. It's very interesting to see what, uh, you know, from your presentation, what bamboo can do, it, what, can, what bamboo can be converted. Uh, I'm wondering uh, whether is this all innovation in bamboo? Is it initiated by the government of China, or is it initiated by the research institute or by private sector? 
And my second question is going to pa, uh, Fatoni. Uh, Fatoni, it's interesting to see that the uh, Ministry of Forestry uh, put attention to this, uh, more than 500 AKPs in Indonesia. Uh, I'm wondering whether, uh, what is the uh, instrument regulations that can uh, link between these NTFPs uh, from the productions into the processing and into the marketing? Because uh, like Bamboo, Rattan, uh, this is not only involved Ministry of Forestry, but also Ministry of Trade and Ministry of Industry. Uh, is there any sort of uh, instrument regulations to, to link uh, inter-ministries? And my last question to Papa Tony is, uh, this morning our president, uh, SBA, mentions about the planting of trees in the last, uh, between, uh, in the last five years, between 2011 and 2014, uh, saying that uh, we have planted like four billion trees in Indonesia. Uh, I'm wondering what is the uh, position of NTFPs in those programs? Uh, do you have any uh, uh, strategies to integrate uh, NTFPs with uh, tree planting because the forest plantation is also quite popular recently. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jay Wahono from Green Power Indonesia. We uh, convert bamboo into electricity in Bangli. Uh, hopefully, we, we will be operational by the end of this year. So I hope to invite all of you to, to come. Uh, my, my question uh, to Dr. Pachori. Uh, if I understand correctly, Indonesia is the third biggest polluter in terms of uh, carbon emission. Is that correct? Uh, so, but in terms of the economy size, we are number 16. Uh, World Bank says we are number 10 uh, based on GDP. But what happens if we double our GDP? Uh, can the world afford uh, to have Indonesia that double the, the carbon emission? Uh, so I guess if we fail to stop the carbon emission and have a, a renewable energy project here in Indonesia that um, replace diesel and the coal fire plant, then I think the world has uh, to contribute. So what 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 is the IPB, IPCC is doing to help Indonesia uh, in achieving that? Thank you. Um, hi, Kathleen Buckingham, World Resources Institute. Um, this is for Dr. Fatoni. Um, I'm just wondering about the Indonesian um, NTFP development strategy, and what are the major challenges? with seeing that implemented? What are, um, for example, are there any restrictions on land that can be used or other things? And what are the low-hanging fruits? So what are the major opportunities you perceive from that? Thank you very much. My name is Daisy. I'm from uh, Forda, Forestry Research uh, Development Agency, uh, Research and Development. And currently, we are uh, having uh, activities in the Bali province that we trying to develop a model on upstream and upstream sector and the uh, uh, downstream sector on bamboo industry development. And I agree with uh, Mr. Hans Frederick that the uh, sometimes in develop, uh, developing country, bamboo is related with the poor. So I agree that we have to put some added value on that. So uh, I want to know, since the INBAR uh, headquarters is in China, as we know China is very uh, advanced in the bamboo industry and development, so maybe you could share to us what is the main strategy or the strategic step if we want to develop on bamboo industry, what is the, I mean, of course the regulation and then also the community, but the important thing is, is how to change the mindset that bamboo is not for the poor anymore. So we can use bamboo industry as the starting. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Um, I think the point that you made is something that really confronts every society in the world. 
And what we really need to do is to look at what growth and development really represents. After all, the whole purpose of economic growth and development is to enhance the welfare of the people. And if the pattern of growth that we are pursuing is going to impose huge negative externalities, including climate change, which is going to have increasingly negative impacts, then we really need to redefine the path of growth and development. And may I say that is entirely feasible. In other words, we can move along a path by which we mitigate the emissions of greenhouse gases. And if you ask me for a country like Indonesia, of course, you do have the problem of deforestation. And that somehow has to be reversed. And that requires not only action at the level of Indonesia, but perhaps globally. And I'm not going to prescribe anything for that. But obviously, that's an outcome which has to be part of the whole mitigation strategy. But what is also important to remember is that if you were to bring about a shift towards mitigation on a large scale, the costs globally are not high at all. As a matter of fact, we've estimated that if we want to limit temperature increase to below 2 degrees Celsius by the end of this century, then all it implies is a reduction in global GDP of 0.06% per year. And that, let's say, in 2030 amounts to 1.7% of the global GDP in 2030. Now, if you look at the benefits in terms of the core benefits, which mean higher energy security, lower levels of pollution at the local level, perhaps even higher employment opportunities, and the benefits of avoiding or delaying the worst impacts of climate change, then it's totally a win-win situation. As one would say, it's a no-brainer. So I think somehow the global community has to understand the enormous benefits of shifting gears towards a path of development that is mitigations oriented. Because the, the alternative of no action is going to be so very high in terms of costs that I think human society must make this choice and move in that direction. And of course, Indonesia is not alone in that. Every society across the globe has to do that. And I hope we have the sense, we have the wisdom, and we have the appreciation of knowledge to be able to do that. Thank you. I think there were a couple of questions about how did China manage to develop its bamboo industry? First, let me say I'm not Chinese, so what I'm saying is my own interpretation uh, of what I understand has happened. The first thing is, this didn't happen overnight. A lot of the, the industrial developments we see uh, that have gone to, to a, a real high level of quality uh, and quality control have taken maybe 20 years to develop. So it's not something that will happen overnight. But I think what, what made it possible in China was a combination of governments, um, you know, local governments that effectively allowed bamboo to be used both as a private investment opportunity, as a communal resource um, to promote basically the use of plantations, either government owned or owned by, by, by a consortium of people, and thirdly, to use bamboo as a, as a means to restore degraded lands and unproductive agricultural lands and eroded lands. So there was a whole governance aspect that's very important. Then there was an infrastructure aspect. What government has done at the local level is put in place, in some cases, roads so that bamboo can be transported to a market and provide the opportunity for a private sector to then develop it. But the actual work and the actual businesses are private businesses. And they basically made use of these, you know, sort of facilitative uh, actions by the government, the local government, to 
develop an industry that initially had some pitfalls and questions and maybe the quality wasn't right up to standard, but is now ironed out most of the problems. So it's a combination really of governments, private sector, and the third area that I didn't mention, which is also very important, is research. There's a whole network of basically research centers that are focused on bamboo and that are looking at still new opportunities. I mean, there's the whole discussion about the chemical properties and the pharmaceutical properties of bamboo, which we don't really know enough about. The possibilities of using bamboo for bioethanol, biobutanol, these are very likely developments, but there's still research going on. How to make natural textiles from bamboo, not viscose based, but actually natural uh, bamboo products. So there's still a lot of research going on, and I think it's that partnership between the research, the government, and the private sector that made it happen. Just to get back to the other question about using bamboo in reforestation, I can't speak for Indonesia, I'll let Dr. Fatoni answer that one, but on a global scale, it's one of the things that we are promoting and we are talking about, how we can actually introduce the concept of using bamboo to basically look at really badly degraded soils. We have some experience in India, for example, um, an old brickyard, not just one brickyard, an old area that was used for brick making, where the soils were completely exhausted, completely degraded, dead, red earth. It's now a green bamboo forest. As I said, there are experiences in, in China where basically non-productive land was restored using bamboo and is now an active, healthy forest with all the economic benefits that come with it. And we're working now in Africa, in Ethiopia, in Ghana, and Tanzania, to do similar sort of work and using bamboo as one means to help with the IG target of basically restoring 20% of degraded landscapes by 2020. So it's possible. I don't know what the experience in Indonesia is. I think that's you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Darin, for the regulation across the sector. Yes, uh, and the MPs, I think, need uh, a, a, a regulation across the sectors because uh, not only producing, but also uh, processing and then also marketing. We have experiences on the how uh, a spot bear on the rattan, for example. Yeah, uh, many times on of uh, uh, this year can be exported uh, or rattan raw material, and then the next year is export ban and so on. And this is, I think, this we need to integrate between the, uh, the sectors, government, Ministry of Forestry, Ministry of. Uh, uh, what is uh, home affairs and also trade and ministry of industry should be still on together and fortunately now we have also the new uh, BAM, national bamboo board and also uh, hopefully uh, very soon will uh, on the ratan also so in this uh, board then all uh, whatever strategy regulation can be discussed uh, integrated between uh, all sectors, all stakeholders, uh, farmers uh, can benefit from the development of the uh, and their peace and the traders also, industries as well as the government. I think uh, I agree that so we need uh, more simple regulation in order that uh, the peace can be uh, developed faster. And uh, in which position uh, and the MPs on the uh, plantings, uh, national planting program. Uh, yes, uh, some species uh, should be uh, introduced in this uh, program. For example, for, for many years ago, we planted already uh, maybe more than well, hundreds, thousands of the what we call this uh, super, uh, what is it, the English eh? And in the next five years, I will, I think, it will be booming sukun uh, for food. Yeah? And then uh, uh, for, uh, for the research and development now, uh, already developed the, the technology how to make it sukun to become 
the uh, kind of rice. So because uh, in the next five years, I think will be booming uh, generated from this planting uh, movement. So I think many uh, species are introduced in this uh, in this uh, program. And also recently, the government also uh, kind of enforcing the uh, district and provincial government through mechanism of uh, dana allocasi khusus, the special uh, fund for allocated to, to the uh, district uh, level in order to planting uh, bamboo. Yeah? So we provide the budget directly to the uh, district level and then instructed that this budget cannot be used other than planting of bamboo. So this is, uh, I think, uh, and uh, is already embracing the policy uh, level to uh, enforcing the district level in order to prepare uh, bamboo uh, raw material for um, industries and, and so on. So this is, I think, uh, again, uh, we need uh, integrated regulation uh, across sectors, uh, so in order that the uh, development of the NDFP is uh, uh, getting faster and benefited to all. And about the problem and opportunities for uh, NDFP's uh, development strategy, I think, as I mentioned, that uh, many uh, problems still we encounter on the developing of the NDFP in Indonesia. For example, about the uh, accurate data and information. Yeah? How many really, uh, uh, for example, ratan, uh, ratan existing in the forest. So we need uh, a, a more uh, inventory so in order to provide the, the accurate data in order that the management can be carried out better. And the second also, I think so far, many NTFP still rely on the uh, natural resources, uh, still very small cultivation. So I think in the future, uh, using this uh, movement, then uh, cultivation of the NTFP uh, will be encouraged. And then also, uh, as Dr. Pachuri uh, mentioned, we need also to have the processing technology in order to, to provide vindicated. Because if bamboo not uh, processes like in China to become new technology, new technology, then the people image bamboo is the traditional. But now I think bamboo already used it for many uh, high te with high technology, and also for example rattan and also others need when you edit using the advanced technology to provide a better image of the non-timber forest products. And I think we have uh, a good opportunity because in the next five years the government uh, already, this is uh, our commitment with cross-sector that we are, we are going to develop more than 600 forest management unit. It means that in the local level, in the site level, so we develop uh, many, many um, NTFPs in order to produce income for the, uh, for the uh, forest management unit. And it's true, that the uh, bamboo is very good for Indonesia also for land rehabilitation because uh, they just really grow naturally along the very slope steep and also and uh, non-productive uh, line, for example, also grew very well bamboo in Indonesia. And also, I think we have uh, opportunity because more than 40 million people is really uh, depend on the forest products. Yeah? They stay around the forest area, inside and outside, uh, near next to the forest area. I think uh, labor is uh, available over there, so if we develop the non timber forest product, then we uh, can benefit for, to uh, our communities. Yeah? And also, the last I think, because the government so far provide huge access for the people to forest management. 
uh, the minister already provide more than five million hectares allocated to the people and all in, in form of uh, community forest and also uh, village forest and also uh, uh, many others uh, form of the uh, management. So I think this is, can be utilized also to develop and to have peace in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Intan. I'm a consultant from C4. And I think the um, presentations are very interesting. And I'm going to give some opinions. And I think like uh, NTFP are apparently very important. And I think, for example, like um, when we learn from the uh, local Le uh, local levels, like the lesson from the local levels, like for example, from uh, <coughs> Google Customer Forest in Jambi Province, and also the uh, Lubuk Beringin uh, Village Forest. I think uh, this mechanism of like promoting NTFPs is already integrated into this like customary forest scheme or village forest. And <coughs> I think uh, the point uh, that I discover is that sometimes it, it's difficult for the for the villagers to find like the market for, for the product and they rely heavily uh, uh, with intermediaries. So, and no matter like how beautiful this like uh, woven basket that they can make, but it's only gonna be, uh, you know, it's, it's un, uh, un, it will be unavailable uh, in the market because it's difficult to find the niche market for this product and especially because of limited access to market information. And I think it's also very important to kind of uh, uh, encourage uh, the promotion of NTFP and as well the customer community because for example like customer community in Google Forest in Jambi they have this uh, traditional knowledge that, you know, this uh, giant uh, tree, Sialan tree, in, in Latin called Pasia it, it, it harvests the Asian giant bees and they have this traditional knowledge that if you actually clean the surrounding of the forest, and then the bee will not, will not come. And I think it's very important as well to give a uh, greater uh, role uh, for the customer community to our NTFB. And I think um, in responding to uh, 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 opinions about village forest, I think like right now the people in the who have adopted the village forest schemes, they are worried that they will have a limited access uh, to the to the to the NTFPs because some of the village forests uh, they are actually protected forests. So the people are entitled to limited access of NTFP products and I think it will definitely make a difference when you have the village forest located like 10 kilometers away from the village and when, when the forest is only like just adjacent to the forest. It, it will discourage people who, even though they were given the rights to access this NTFP, but, but if, the, if the forests are located 10 kilometers away, they they will not simply just don't want to harvest it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunities that gave to me. My name is Vibri from Bogor Agricultural University, undergraduate student. Uh, from some preference that I've read before that bamboo is high water absorber and good in carbon sequestration. Uh, is it possible using bamboo for green public area in big cities which has problem with diminishing water catchment and air pollution issues? Thank you. I guess it was bamboo. <laughs> Um, you know, it's a, it's a really good question because I think, again, I think you 
using bamboo in urban environments has not really been explored to the extent that you might expect. But it does happen, for sure. I think, in general, it's, it's understood and totally accepted now that green cities are healthier. Cities with trees, cities with, with vegetation, basically provide shade, they provide cleaner air, they provide opportunities for recreation, people feel healthier, it's good for your mental capacity. So, cities that are green, not just as far as emissions are concerned, or as far as, as, as car management are concerned, but cities that actually have green spaces are healthy cities. Can you use bamboo? It depends a little bit. Bamboo grows in the tropics. So, to assume that you could do this in Europe or in the States or in Southern Australia, I guess it's not likely. To do this in the tropical belt is definitely possible. There's one challenge I think we have to be aware of. Several species of bamboo, for example the ones that I showed a photo of in China, are what we call running bamboo and the root systems grow very fast. That's fantastic if you're out in a rural area, it's very good if you're talking about erosion control, slope stabilization or general restoration of bad lands. If you're in an urban environment, maybe a different story. So which type of bamboo to use would be a question because if you have the bamboo where the root systems go under the surface of the pavement or actually affect even the foundation of buildings, you may create problems that you weren't actually expecting. But using bamboo in an urban environment for modern urban planning definitely is possible. We've been given the signal that we need to close very soon, so I just uh, want to close. Uh, one of the things that I picked up when people were talking, and I see this in India quite often, it seems as if Indonesia is solving it, is that NTFPs, not just Bangu and Rattan, but the other NTFPs, fall between the stools of different ministries, so no one actually owns it. I know in India we had a very interesting situation where Bangu was considered part of the forestry ministry, then thanks to a lot of NGOs and academics working, it was removed from there, mostly because of people having access to it, then it was biologically classified as a grass, which it is, which meant rural people could use it, but then the forest ministry lost interest in it. The agriculture ministry was handed in for a while, but they didn't really care, they didn't know about it. And then because of linked with other NTFPs, the uh, small-scale industry promotion board started access. But no one actually owns bamboo, rattan, medicinal plants. When there's money, for example, with medicinal plant, people suddenly get interested. But otherwise, no one really owns it. And I think that is one of the problems. Uh, that's just something I wanted to say. Would you like to make some closing statements and then we can... Yeah, uh, I think in terms uh, uh, as to about the, uh, the access of the villages to the market, why bamboo uh, so far become like this in China? Because the government and the industry and the, uh, the, the scientists work together uh, and also develop together. Not only the villages, but the government provide the access, provide the technology, and so on, so that uh, bamboo becomes uh, uh, new uh, products, uh, high products, and then can be marketed. So I think uh, the most important for us, I think, we have to work together between the the government provide the regulation access and uh, also the businessmen, the industry, people, and also the academia, the scientists who have the research on this, uh, uh, this issue. So in this, I think we will be able to develop uh, the NTFPs and benefit it to the, to the people. And uh, in Indonesia, I think the all 565 items of the NTFPs is really regarding the raw material is belong to the Ministry of Forestry. So the processing will be in the other minister and the trading will be in the other minister as well. So that is why we have to work together between sectors in order that NTFPs 
can be developed not only by one sector, one minister, but also all together and working together to become this uh, good product, uh, available raw material, and that industry can uh, protest the better and that market uh, access or the market is very important. So this is, I think, that is why Ratan, for, for example, we also propose to uh, Dr. Hans, uh, because Indonesia, 80% uh, of the raw material, good raw material is from Indonesia. But from the from the figure, uh, raw material only 3% of the total value, 97% uh, coming from the uh, finished products and funds products. So that is why uh, we have to provide the value added to high technology in order that we can more value from the raw material uh, to get benefit for, for the people. And, Dr. Bachari, thank you very much for having joined us. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.